Hi, welcome to the picture of this podcast or audio format. You can listen to it while you jog or work out or whatever. Look it up in your podcasting app. Today, the topic is finding inspiration without, without copying. copying. Yeah, yeah. I, we see a ton of pictures. We get a lot of people asking us, what should I take pictures of? I'm really tired of taking pictures of my cat, my kids, myself, my food. Please help me find a subject. So we figured we'd help you out with that today. Tell you some ways to find inspiration. Tell you some ways to not find inspiration. And dig into kind of the ethics of copying somebody else's work or being inspired by how do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? <laughs> That's a joke. This podcast is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. They have beautiful award-winning design templates, all-in-one platform, award-winning 24-7 customer support, and it's flexible for any kind of website. You don't need a photography portfolio if you have a store or you're a craftsman of any sort. A Squarespace portfolio would be perfect for you. So start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter the offer code portfolio to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace.com slash Tony. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Squarespace. Okay. First, you wanted to cover some bad cliches. Yeah, because I think that this is how we all start. I am guilty of doing bad cliches. Okay. You see a picture that you like or that's popular and you think, I have the stuff to do that. I could do that. And then you end up with a thousand pictures of your friends in scarves. I'm not talking about an actual hijab or uh, a chador or anything, any kind of religious head adornment. I'm talking about putting a scarf on your friend and acting like that's really doing something. Um, the problem with this is that you're seeing a picture that you like and you're recreating it without really dissecting what's good about the photo. Maybe that's what's going on. So you can see some good photos like that, but often you just see a photo that's a cliche and you think, but that's one of those. Yep, that's one of the scarf photos. Yeah, and things become cliche because the original is something compelling. Yeah, so I think, I think that this cliche started with people really being in love with the Afghan girl picture taken by Steve McCurry. Um, and of course, you know, the fact that she's wearing a beautiful red scarf on her head is a part of the photo. But what people ignore when they just take the cliche photo is that there's an entire story here. There's color contrast for one thing, um, the red with the green background with her green eyes. But there's also the fact that this photo, even though there's not much context, tells a story with her expression. She has an intense expression. She's this beautiful young girl. She has dirt on her face. She is kind of, kind of this beautiful person stuck in poverty and he captures this moment where you feel like she's almost looking right at you it's a gorgeous photo so to just put a scarf on somebody and think that you're recreating it no, that's missing. all you need is just the right scarf and you can make the same photoshop Steve eyes. McCurry picture yeah yeah, no. yeah that's all it takes just yeah brighten up the eyes enough no but that i can see how that happens i've done that myself uh another cliche that really gets me is the fur hood and I looked up pictures just to give examples. Um, so many of them are not good. And I think people look at the fur hood pictures and they like them. And they think that the fur hood is doing the work once again. But what's really happening is that you're getting natural framing of the face. Uh, maybe the fur interacts nicely with lighting or they like to picture with backlighting or some color contrast or the model had amazing makeup or it was snowing. I'm certain that the inspiration picture on this one had so much more going on than just a fur hood, but people kind of take the most distinct thing in the photo and think that's making the photo. I, I think the fur hood in the best examples eliminates any distractions. It creates its own background. So you don't have stuff behind the person you have, like it allows you to fill a horizontal frame with the person's face. I think it's, hood. that's a key part of it anyway. I, I but think yeah, it's people don't framing people, a beautiful people don't face. Yeah. That. They're yeah. just like, they see the picture and they're like, Oh, it's the hood that's making it. I'll grab a hood. I can I recreate that. that same thing. And that is kind of the process of inspiration, but the person is missing the point. They're not seeing what actually made the original photo. Right. Great. Exactly. They're simplifying it too much. One more. 
the train track photos. <laughs> Everyone, I think so many people have the tried these. I, we've done them. And I think that it's important not to make fun of these cliches so much because I think what everyone is saying when they take one of these cliche photos is, I liked the train track photo, but I didn't think about completely why I liked it. And I don't think it's just the train tracks. I think it's converging lines. It's a great example of converging lines in a wide open space where you get an opportunity to see them go from filling the frame to going off in the distance. And it's, they're usually surrounded by a natural setting. Um, and you get to put your subject right in between the leading lines. You could look at a train track photo and say, I need train tracks, or you could look at it and say, I really like what converging lines do in a photo. And so today we want to talk to you about dissecting your inspiration and copying it in a way that's not just copying, but rather being inspired and applying different concepts to your own unique creative work. Yeah. And sometimes when you feel that little, that little spark in your brain of, mm. oh, I see something I like. I like it. Sometimes you don't just look at the obvious and run with that or get inspired by that, but you have to dig a little bit deeper. Well, I have some cool examples. And it doesn't later. have to be a photo. You can, that spark can be sparked from anything. I, I want to build people up with this. I don't want to make people feel guilty. So I want to ask the question, is all copying bad? No, I don't definitely think so. not. I really don't think so. And I don't think you can necessarily directly copy a photo and then call it your own. But I think it's an incredible exercise to look at a picture like the Afghan girl, the Steve McCurry photo and say, I want to try to exactly replicate it. And in doing so, I think you could learn a lot about taking a picture. You can learn it's not all about the head scarf. It's about the lighting, the color contrast, the expression, the mood, right? Yeah, that is what's great about it. I've tried to copy pictures before just as an exercise. Right. And what you immediately realize is when you think you can copy it, you can't. Because you start to realize there's so much more depth in it than you initially saw. Right. But that teaches you in turn to see the depth that's in there. You right. realize, oh my goodness, I set up two lights, but they actually have four lights going. Or some of these lights were gelled and I never thought about that. Or, oh man, my model can't create an expression like the person that's in that original photograph. Right. And though your finished product might not be original or even necessarily your photo at that point, along the way, you're going to pick up lessons and you're going to learn things that you can apply to your own future creative work. It's completely original. And even the word copying, I think might be a have little a negative connotation. Yeah. And a copy means like a duplicate, like a one to one duplicate. And that's allowed in basically no art whatsoever. For right. example, in music, you, you could copy somebody's song. They might call it covering, but you have to basically pay the original person some money if it's published in a certain way, uh, or you could sample them. That's kind of a type of copying too. But again, you end up paying them. So they have a system in place to credit. At that point, you have to admit it. And once and, you're admitting that it's a part of your work and you're reworking it, that's something different than just trying to directly take that idea. I think what happens more often in photography is inspiration. And sometimes the inspiration is so direct that you immediately know where it came from. And other times it's, it's building on somebody else's work and adding your own to it. Uh, so I want to, you know, it's not always bad. Like Chuck Berry was inspiration for the Beatles and the Beatles were inspiration for U2 and Coldplay was in or U2 was inspiration for Coldplay. And I know all the music snobs out there are freaking out at the train that I kind of, <laughs> the yeah. path that I followed here yeah. spinning from Chuck Berry to Coldplay. <laughs> uh, but that is the truth of what often happens with inspiration. Uh, it doesn't always go in the direction that you want, but it also branches out. Yeah, there are out. millions of artists who've been inspired by Chuck Berry in one way or another at, at different levels. And some of them you're going to, sometimes you're going to like the original. Sometimes you might like the inspiration better. Um, and I think when you do take inspiration from something, you, you strive to improve upon it and you draw inspiration from multiple different sources and put it together. And Make I think, your own, yeah. yeah, I think this brings us to the question of what, creativity is on a fundamental level 
And I, I've studied creativity some, and the funny thing about it is humans are not very creative. They're really not. We rarely have a completely original idea. And if you look back at mythology, mythology had lots of crazy creatures in it, like the Minotaur. The Minotaur was uh, like a human body, but with a bull head. Yeah. And the centaur was a horse body, but with a human torso. Yeah. And then you had uh, like Medusa, which was a woman, but had snakes in her hair. And none of these, these are all things that don't exist. They were a creative idea. But they were just two things that existed, like cut it in half. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now they we have quite, something new. They quite literally just took one thing and put it into another. But it's not just the physical description of the the subject you know you you made a minotaur with a man and a bull but then it inhabited these mazes and chased people around and so you you the physical description became an inspiration for this other backstory that in itself was also creative and original so i don't and i don't think there's too many completely original and creative ideas in the world, though I do think they pop up. So a lot of people wonder how to find inspiration. We've given some examples of creativity and different types of inspiration that people have drawn on. Um, I think that a good way to find inspiration is to broaden your worldview a bit. That means come out of your shell and you're gonna have to learn different things and experience different things. And one of those things is just the basics of art. If you're going to make a photo that's considered good and that's creative and original, you have to understand all other art that came before you. You cannot be a self-centered person contained in your own world, really. Um, so you'll need to learn about composition and color theory and lines, how lines and lights and shape and everything works in a piece of art that makes it compelling. Um, so study the revered artists, even the ones that you think are boring have a really interesting story. And you might learn that during their time, they were a rock star that innovated something pretty incredible. That's usually how it goes. Something that seems unremarkable and common now, they probably pioneered it. You look at someone like Da Vinci and he figured out perspective and lines and composition in a way that other people just weren't working with. So look at those pictures, appreciate them, even if they're not your style and try to find out what made art great. And then you can put yourself in the context of all of that art. No, and that's BS. Photography is just like exposure triangle. I just need to work out the exposure triangle and I'll be fine. You know, what ISO? Settings? XF? Those, pictures, those comments make me crazy because there's something so much bigger out there than just that stuff. I mean, it, it's important. I don't want to undervalue it, but it's not everything. So go experience all different types of art, not just photography, but paintings and sculptures. And you'll learn a lot about light and composition and color. Um, even if it's not something that you like, look at it, study it, and ask yourself, what's the takeaway here? What is this artist trying to say? And how could I apply this to my work? You know who I learned that from? Who? Um, Mondrian. You know the painter, and he does the white paintings, and then they have black lines, and then a block of... Uh, red and a block of yellow. Yeah. I always thought that was so ugly and I didn't get it at all. And I just thought it was like 80s or something. I thought it was so tacky. <laughs> and then we were at a museum and I saw it and I was looking at it and it just clicked. I was like, this is, he has stripped this art down to the most basic study of composition. And I think that's what they're called composition one, composition two. And I realized he was, using uh, color and space and lines to balance a completely empty canvas. And if you're a photographer, you should appreciate that because sometimes you're looking at a whole mess of a world and you somehow have to balance all of that in a frame, right? So Mondrian just takes these colors and he can balance a whole white swath of canvas with this red square. And I thought, that's brilliant. That's exactly what you do in photography. You need to balance things with more than just lines, but color gives weight and uh, lines give weight. It's and on a deeper level, one of the recurring themes here is to find somebody's work that you like and go to a lower and lower level. Yeah. And in his case, he simplified, 
he took art and simplified it into one of the most basic things. And on, that can be applied on a very direct level in photography. You might see a picture that has, you like some part of it, but maybe it's too cluttered. You can simplify it to its most basic level and try to recreate that in your own photos. Or you could make it really complicated. If you look at, Justin and I were just looking at The Last Supper, and if you look at all the lines and the placement of the hands and the bread and the perspective of the leading lines all leading to Jesus, uh, you realize it's not just a painting of people. Everyone is placed in a very deliberate way, in a way that's most aesthetically pleasing to the composition. Um, yeah, study art. It's going to help your photography a lot. Well, tell me about these still life photos. Um, I had this example here of an inspiration photo. So this is Caravaggio, and he is a Baroque painter. Um, so this was around 1600, this was painted. And at that time, well, the, this is just the end of the Renaissance. So it's like re late Renaissance. And at that time, paintings often told a story you weren't allowed to say out loud without being punished. Um, so there was a lot of symbolism with fruit and skulls and, you know, still lives. They have, you know, all sorts of uh, shells and compasses and things like that. At the time that he painted this, people were analyzing it and thinking that the fruit was very, like, sexual, you know? It's like this moist, cut-open fruit. It sounds corny, but that's, like, look at that gourd pointing up. I mean... We have <laughs> some, gourd. we're alluding to something very fertile. I think that the fruit itself represents some kind of fertility and a lushness. And the fruit is cut open and kind of sexualized. Um, it's a far stretch, but it's 1600. So, you know, they could have been more conservative about that kind of thing. Then along comes David LaChapelle, who is a photographer, and he puts his own spin on it. And you see, he still has a lot of the same elements. There's fruit. It's cut open in a way that's unusual and far more suggestive because you wouldn't cut a watermelon like that unless you were a monster. Um, <laughs> but he leaves the plastic wrap on. He's making a different statement. There's this cheapness to our culture now, and he's using this very traditional um still life to tell a story about modern culture and i think it's really interesting i think you could look at it and say whoa that's ugly what's this guy doing but once again you put it in the context of art and you're like oh maybe you're on to something david <laughs> david le chapelle is another great example of somebody you can take inspiration from because you could look at david le chapelle's work and try to steal specific elements or you could study his greater body of work and realize that one of his secrets is taking inspiration from great pictures, Classical great artists, art. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about looking at other art and how to draw inspiration from that. But there are other ways that you can find inspiration and be creative as well. And one of them is by severely limiting yourself, which is kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, this is a technique that I just stumbled across accidentally. Uh, I was just decided I was going to test some prime lenses. I normally shoot with zooms. I started shooting with primes. And when we went on a trip to Spain and just shooting with those primes forced me to start thinking about things in a different way because I'd stumble on a scene that maybe I'd normally shoot at 70 millimeters, but I had my 24 millimeter lens on me. And so I would force myself to look at it from a different perspective, look at the background and try to find different ways to integrate more background in than I might have otherwise wanted to. You can force re restrictions on yourself in other ways like using different lenses is a good thing or prime lenses you could use a pinhole camera which severely restricts what you do we have a video on pinhole cameras that nobody has watched <laughs> that's really <laughs> useful uh you could use restrict yourself to just using your smartphone or shoot only in black and white totally eliminate color from your imagery that'll force you to tell the story that you're going to tell with shape and light and form and never color uh, or you could put your camera down and just draw stuff or paint stuff. We've taken painting lessons before and we've spent some time painting and that did teach me about photography because it forced me to think, oh, can I, what, what are the key elements of the light and the story? And if I'm going to show water in a picture, what does it actually take? Yeah, your, your brain can start to think differently if you're using your body in a different way. So something that will inspire me sometimes is um, just design in general, even interior design. It sounds silly, but setting up a bookshelf to be aesthetically pleasing, you're balancing books 
and shapes and colors. Um, and I find that doing things with my hands and being very hands-on starts to stimulate the, creati the creative part of my brain. And then I'll start thinking, oh, well, what if I did uh, red and black in a photo shoot? Or what if I did the light like this? Or, and I can start to translate it to my photography. I just wanted to pitch out a couple other ideas, like only point your camera straight up or straight down, or limit yourself to a specific shutter speed, like uh, only shoot at a quarter of a second or half a second or a full second, where there's necessarily going to be motion in all of your pictures, and your yeah. pictures will have to tell a story with motion built and into it. I think forcing yourself to commit to a project can be really great, too. I know somebody <clears throat> that committed to just shooting 50 millimeter for a year. And that yeah. forces you to stick with it. Sometimes people try something and they say, oh, well, that didn't really look good. I'm going to move on. But if you look at a lot of artists, again, going back to more traditional art, uh, they did the same painting 30 times or 50 times. You have to just keep at something if you want to stumble upon something different sometimes. Yeah, that's something I learned from Monet because you can go watch, Mo look, look at Monet's bridge. Yeah. If you go to one of his exhibits and they will have, I don't know, on the order of like 20 or 30 paintings of the bridge. Like, and they, the first one is like terrible. You have OCD. <laughs> By the time it gets to like 15 or 20, like, oh, it's shaping up. Yeah. It's starting to look like the bridge that you know. Uh, I also want to say you can mentally remove all restrictions from yourself. Because I think so many people think I can't get a good picture because I'm in this boring town or in this boring house or I don't have a car or I don't have a decent camera or whatever. All my kids are ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck at home with my baby. Free yourself of all your mental limits. I Imagine know. a future where you have unlimited money and technology is unlimited, where you can visualize, do anything and visualize anything. And then with this in your mind, you're unlimited. What do you come up with? And once you come up with something amazing and grand and moving, think about how you can then create that. Put on a budget. So many people just think of, oh, what can I do with what I have? They look around and they try to build something out of that. Instead, build something mentally and then think, which pieces of that can I create from what I have? How can I make this work rather than what are the reasons that I can't, that this can't possibly work? Photography is cool like that too, because so, so much is inferred. So you often, to create the scene you want to create, you often don't need the big studio you imagined. You can always just like crop it down to a headshot. Yeah. If you don't have a big set to work with, a lot of people say, I don't have the space for a studio. You don't need it. You only need enough space to have your camera, your light, your model. It's fine. And on a personal, I'll say that this process was the inspiration for the book, Stunning Digital Photography. Cause I just thought to myself, how, what would be the ultimate classroom in the future? How will people a hundred years from now learn something like this? And obviously, I couldn't do that today. But I, from that vision, I was able to take some key elements like collaborative video. learning online, integrating video, community, uh, you know, self-paced stuff. And that became something useful and something that hadn't been done before. This one's fun. Working with a partner, find another photographer or artist, even somebody that doesn't do photography. Maybe you could find uh, someone that's into like crafts or painting or sewing that can help you make some element of your picture and work with them and see how they think differently. They'll probably bring some different experiences and skills to the table and you can inspire one another and push push each other out of your comfort comfort zone. Yeah, and go with the answer of yes by default. Yeah. If somebody the more different the person is than you, the better because they'll have ridiculous ideas and you should just say yes i'm going to go with that that happens to us all, all the, the time. time i'm always open i usually i'm a headstrong person and i know what i want and when i work with someone else i usually just let them do it because i can learn more that way i'm not going to learn a lot by executing the vision i already have if i just watch somebody else work i learn a lot roxy rodriguez is an example that comes to mind for me we worked with her in la we did a photo shoot and i just really liked watching her and what i learned i was missing um is i'm not as good at engaging with the model as her and she had such an energy where she really was drawing the model out and i was learning that drawing the model out and getting those um, really sincere expressions and making sure they're having a good time. That's a big part of getting a great shot. So work with someone else and learn from them. I also want to encourage people to embrace chaos, just randomness, because there are things that are genuinely random 
in this world. Uh, and some art can come from that. The Have you ever seen glitch art? Yeah, I love glitch art. That is a truly random form of art. And in the so last you want to explain it to people? five, 10 years, we've really seen it take off. I've seen a lot of music videos that integrate glitch art into it. But besides just intentionally introducing glitches, people start lining clips up so that they overlay each other in meaningful ways yeah. and they glitch together. And this is something that didn't exist before. You can't look to Michelangelo to get inspiration for glitch art. It had to happen by accident. Penicillin happened by accident. Lots of things will happen by accident. So allow a little bit of chaos in your life. Don't force everything to be regimented and regular. Take a wrong turn. I think people are afraid of that randomness because I think they're afraid of making mistakes and you just have to get over that. There's going to be a lot of people that don't like your pictures either way. You have to be happy with it and you have to know that you're learning from each one. So don't take it so seriously that you're afraid to make a mistake or a misstep or do something too different or what people might think is weird from time to time. Just embrace that free flow of random thought and try to do something different. Just drive in a random direction or walk in a random direction. Go to a restaurant you would never, ever go to. Look up TripAdvisor and scroll down to the worst rated event. Get a friend with ADD because that. that seems to be my <laughs> Just superpower. follow them around. <laughs> uh, watch a foreign film where you can't understand the words and just look at the visuals. Take a bird and, and then tie a string to it and then now you got a kite. <laughs> there you go. Have you seen Bollywood films? There's plenty yeah. of visual inspiration in them. Uh, <laughs> and I'll also encourage people to just be quiet, silent, because so many creative ideas for me come when I'm just in, in the, the shower. shower. Oh, yep. me too. Or <laughs> just driving with the radio off alone. I drive with the radio off alone too. Babe, we're the same even when we're apart. <laughs> Justin, do you have good ideas in the shower? Uh, no, they're pretty <laughs> random. So it doesn't Just work like, for everybody. What kind of TV I watched last night or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I have all sorts of crazy. I start drawing stuff on the glass. I'm like, I'm going to do this. I got big plans in the shower. <laughs> yeah, my mind wanders, but starts also making random connections. And I, I can't tell you how many times I'll take a long shower and then I'll come out of it and I'll be like, I know a video we should make. Yeah. So many of the videos that you've watched... <laughs> Or shower ideas. <laughs> We're created entirely in the shower. I also keep a journal at my bedside or close to my bedside because I have a lot of ideas when I'm just laying there in the morning or trying to go to sleep or even I'll wake up from a dream and have a dream that gives me an idea. Yeah, that is one of the mental keys to creativity is in sleep and in twilight, your brain literally starts making like random electrical connections, like stuff just gets wired in randomly and that's why dreams can be so crazy but you don't have those crazy thoughts during the day I do. run with those <laughs> that's part of the that's randomness thing life. that it's <laughs> the only it's your brain's own random creativity but just go with it and write it down so you don't forget it lastly i wanted to study a couple of examples of people who were innovative and creative and how their work unfolded over time as a result of the inspiration by other people and the first example I wanted to bring up was uh, Trey Ratcliffe and his work in HDR, which I think now when people hear HDR, everybody kind of rolls their eyes like, oh, tone mapping, just tired of that. Um, but in originally, Trey Ratcliffe was this remarkable landscape photographer. And who, still is, yeah. Yeah, he's, he has continued to be. And he was traveling around the world and producing these amazing, amazing pictures. And he used this very mundane high dynamic range software in a creative way. It wasn't intended to, do, intended to do the sort of extreme things that it's become known for. It was just meant to extend the dynamic range of an image. That was yeah. it. He used something boring in a creative way and created this new genre of photography. But uh, everybody else figured out how to do this. Yes. And then they took bad pictures and applied HDR and then people equated and applied bad HDR and then people equated HDR with ugly pictures. So if you go back to Trey's early pictures when his HDR work was uh, really taking off, there were two parts to it. He was There was the really hard part, 
where he packed up his stuff and traveled for months at a time and explored weird parts of the world and, and got, got up super compositions early. compositions and light and yeah. Yeah, and then there was this other part that was uh, tuning stuff in software. And people didn't copy what really made his pictures magical, which was that months and months and so much money It's like the effort. headscarf and the fur hoodie. <laughs> exactly, it's exactly like that. Uh, I also want to bring up in the same vein, Casey Neistat as an example of vlogger a lot of people will recognize. Can I just one quick moment go back to Trey and say yeah. that even though what I like about Trey is that um, like the fad, like the headscarfiness of it has kind of died down, but he has continued to reinvent himself and tweak his style and his photos are still really stunning and beautiful. Yeah, I should have said that. I, I continue to follow his work, and I've seen him reinvent himself yeah. and move past it. And yeah. that is the the secret. You don't get yourself locked into something, but if you're a creative person, you're constantly innovating. You're always looking for the next thing, and you're trying to be one step ahead of it. And he is. His work is new and different now. Yeah. Um, what about Casey? Casey, nice at a vlogger that a lot of people are familiar with. He didn't necessarily invent vlogging, but he certainly popularized it. And he did so by using a variety of cheap cameras that anybody could get, but in creative ways. And Casey's secret was always amazing storytelling. He found ways to position cameras to tell stories in ways that were also visually interesting. And he pieced it together with music that was compelling, uh, simple titles and text that just very clearly brought you from point A to point B. And people, were inspired. <laughs> Some people straight up copied, but they didn't get down to the root of what made Casey successful, which was interesting storytelling. And his personality. And yeah. he, he, him and his personality. But what you saw instead was people copying the exact same music, the same, same music, fonts. skateboard. Yeah, the same. Yeah, they will literally be on the same skateboard in the same places, uh, copying scenes frame by frame practically. Yeah. hoping that it will lead them to the same success. But that's not what inspiration is. People don't like it if you copy, but you can be inspired. You can learn. And again, you take it down a step lower. It's not what's obvious. There's one thing, a level below that, that you can learn from. And that you can copy. Amazing storytelling. Nobody's going to mind if you That copy never goes out of style. Amazing storytelling. Just like amazing composition and light won't go out of style. Like... Yeah, you got to copy what's great about it. Uh, an artist, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Aiden Buyukatas. Uh, he probably right. He took inspiration from uh, the movie Inception. In Inception, it's yeah. this movie where you go inside of a dream, inside of a dream. It's weird in there. And like a dream, there's a lot of uh, bizarre things happening, including like basically bending space. So you might be looking out over a field, but it would seem to bend up at a 90 degree you angle, a wall, like, uh, which like wouldn't happen picture. in the real world. And this photographer took that idea and figured out a way to create it in his own photographs. And they, that is so crazy. Yeah. They turned out absolutely They're stunning. Excellent. And when I first saw this work, I thought this is a brilliant example of creative inspiration. And in one of my long showers, I must have spent half an hour mentally figuring out exactly how to do this. I think I know how he does it. I figured it out too. And I I thought, oh. But it's such a smooth transition. I would love to do this. I would love to make a video showing other people how to do this. People are going to love it. And then I thought, no, I know how this goes. If I show people how to do this and make it easy to do. Yeah. People are going to go out there and they're going to do bad examples of it. And then ruin it for And him. then it's going to be the next HDR. And so I just passed. I just didn't ever make the tutorial. I I haven't yet made one of these pictures of my own, though I, I think I want to just uh, because I think it would be a fun process. So the difference between uh, Aiden and Trey Ratcliffe and this part of the software-based thing is that he, Aiden did something that was a little bit harder. It was hard enough that not everybody could immediately do it. Now, I did recently see an article where somebody showed basically how to do this at a high level, but the example pictures they used were not nearly as good as the originals here. Well, yeah, because if you look at the one on the right, look at the color contrast, the red car um, with the green grass surrounding it. I mean, it'd be a completely different 
picture if he didn't have that red car there. Yeah, because he went a step beyond just making a special type of panorama. The pictures themselves have a brilliant composition that uses that unique perspective. You know, but I the other could examples I saw by other people were just just they just made a panorama of any boring scene and it didn't work. Yeah. Because they missed the lower level part of it. They missed the real art of it. What were you gonna say? I could I could make it my own by adding half a bowl. <laughs> what what if there's a, a chick with a fur scarf in the face? <laughs> I can do it on train tracks like he did and then put the chick with the fur hood. Oh, that's a See? great idea. We're combining it and she's floating by balloons. Wait, naked except for the fur hood. It's gonna Na- be huge. It's gonna be big. People are gonna love it. She's gonna be a bikini. All right. That's it. Thank That's you it. to our sponsor, who is also Squarespace. Squarespace it, is everything to us. <laughs> okay. And if you want your own Squarespace, you can start your free trial today at squarespace.com slash Tony and use the offer code portfolio to get 10% off of your first purchase. Thank you, Squarespace, for making this podcast possible. And thank you to all of you for watching. I hope we inspired you to go out and look for inspiration. Let's use the YouTube comments to add your own ideas for inspiration and where you think the line is between being inspired and just plagiarism. Yeah, and what would you combine with half a bowl to make something new? (laughs) That's what I've been wondering. Thanks, bye. Bye.